So in case you did not um, hear me yesterday, my name is Judith Covington. I am from Louisiana State University in Shreveport. And my job is to introduce our speakers this morning and to keep us on time. So I plan to do that definitely. So before we start with our first talk this morning, I've been asked to make a few announcements. Um, someone mentioned yesterday that all of the sessions that we do are recorded and taped. And to help with that, um, the management team that works with that has asked every speaker to please get them a digital copy of their presentation. And I have heard that three-fourths of our speakers from this morning have not done that. So if you are speaking at all today, if you can get your documents to the back table, they would greatly appreciate that. So I believe it is now exactly 8.30, so it's time for us to start our first talk. Um, and I am honored to introduce Diana White. Diana White is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, and she was her department's first hire as a mathematician who was going to specialize in mathematics education. Currently, she focuses on teacher training and teacher professional development. In particular, she is interested in teachers' development of mathematical knowledge for teaching and in helping other mathematicians learn to work effectively with teachers. She is part of an NSF grant to work with a team through the American Institute of Mathematics to study the impact of math teacher circles on participating teachers. I'm honored to introduce Diana White. Thanks, Judy, and thanks for the friendly reminder about the slides there. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the organizers and all of you for being here so early in the morning. Um, to kick off our next session today. So what I'm going to talk about is math teacher circles. We'll tell you a little bit about what they are, et cetera. And we're going to make the case that they are inquiry-based learning for practicing teachers. So the main themes that I want to go through, and I'm sorry, I'm, I haven't stood in front of a podium in about 15 years and giving a talk. We were allowed to our first talk ever when I was in Intel school, getting trained to be an Intel officer, and then we were kicked out and told you can't hide behind podiums. So it's a little counterintuitive to me. The main themes of the talk that we want to emphasize today is, and I used standardized testing notation there for you, that IBL is to undergraduates as math teacher circles are to in-service teachers. And I want to make the point that we're missing a key audience by not addressing these in-service teachers more if we really want to affect change in mathematics education across the country and encourage more people to really understand what mathematics is as a discipline, which is, I think, a key component of what inquiry-based learning is about. We want to build bridges. And this audience is very uniquely qualified to do that. And I'll talk about why more later in the talk. We're also getting a lot of preliminary research on the math teacher circles that are very positive in nature. That won't be our primary focus of this talk. That would be a very separate talk. But there is a group of us studying them and several other smaller groups who've done some research related to them. And all indicators so far are very positive. So it's not just heuristic evidence that we have at this point. It's getting deeper that that, than that, that these are substantial professional development programs for teachers. And then the final thing I'll do is I'll invite you to come to a breakout session led by several others later this afternoon to see for yourself what a sample session is like and decide if it's something you would be interested in potentially getting involved with in some way. <clears throat> but let's back up a little bit and let's look at what is inquiry-based learning. So I went to the AIBL website that Stan has put together, um, probably with some, the help of others, and I sent him this email asking if I was allowed to quote directly from it, and he said I could. So according to it, inquiry-based learning is defined very liberally. It's defined basically as a teaching method that engages students in sense-making activities. And it goes on to list solving problems, posing problems, conjecturing, experimenting, exploring, creating, communicating, et cetera. All themes that we've heard come up, certainly I've heard them at the last four of the, I've been at four of the last five of these. Those of you who've been at the ones for over the past decade, I'm guessing you've heard these themes for at least that long, if not longer. Let's make an observation about this. It seems like we tend to think about inquiry-based learning mainly for undergraduates and traditional graduate programs. 
We talk a lot about calculus. That's the main theme of the conference here. Certainly an extremely important area um, because it's an entry level um, to mathematics at the college level. Courses for math majors, courses for the pre-service teachers, those who are undergraduates in training or those who are changing careers and doing their initial licensure to become teachers but aren't actually out in the classroom yet. Um, and then of course, graduate courses, which is how a lot of this started. But what about K-12 teachers? What about the people already out in the field who may have taught for 10 or 20 years and have never experienced something like that? How do we reach them? How do we give them these same rich mathematical experiences? I'm going to pose that one way we could do this is through math teacher circles. And these are professional development programs that are primarily aimed at middle level teachers. But there are some groups that are doing elementary or secondary and certainly no reason to restrict from expanding that way. They're loosely organized through the American Institute of Mathematics in Palo Alto, California. And I think it'd be fair to say that they're really focused on mathematical problem solving. And for those of you who are familiar with the Common Core State Standards that have come out and become the central focus in mathematics education in a lot of ways, they're focused there not on the content standards so much, but on the standards of mathematical practice. So both of those really getting at a disciplinary understanding of mathematics and what it's about. There are over 40 active chapters. It's really hard to keep count because they keep expanding as more chapters come in. They go back to about 2006. We expect around 8 to 10 more to launch this summer. The basic formats a roughly one week summer immersion workshop, often away, off site, where the teachers are immersed for four or five days with each other, with mathematicians in doing mathematics. And then there are academic follow up sessions either during the week after classes end or some circles use weekends to bring people together depending on local situations. I want to mention and point you to a few key people that I know are here at this meeting that are involved with it. So if you see any of them, you can ask them um, about the program or how to get involved, et cetera. So as I, if, Tatiana, if you could raise your hand. Paul? Altha, is she here? Oh, there she is. Judy, you just introduced us all. And Angie, are you in the room? Uh oh, I didn't think to make sure these people knew ahead of time. So I'm now calling Angie out if she's not here. But that's OK. She knows all about this. If you see her, by all means, ask her as well. The next thing I want to do is I want to give you a task. And I'm going to ask you to do some things that are hard for you to do as mathematicians. I'm going to give you a typical math teacher circle problem. But your goal for the purposes of this, of this talk is not to solve it. Please don't spend as, as, interest, as much as you might like to the rest of my talk trying to solve it. Um, that happens every time I give it. Somebody comes up to me at the end, is this the answer? I'm like, oh, you missed the point. Um, or the rest of the day, I'm sure the other speakers have things they'd like to convey to you. Um, but once you have some free time, by all means, then go back and focus on uh, trying to solve the problem. For the purpose here, though, it's to make the point of what kind of problems are these about and how can we provide these rich mathematical experiences to teachers? Um, so when I give you the problem on the next slide, if you would please ensure that you understand it, and I'll talk you through it. And then focus not on, hey, what's, what's the answer here, but what are different approaches to it? Where's the mathematics coming from and emanating from in this problem? And then if you'll notice, think about how the following properties could arise through the problem. You'll see the same list as from a few slides ago, with the exception of solving the problem, on it. So six other key things that we've said, or the AIB All website has said, are key features of inquiry-based learning. So think about this problem and the concept, construct of how it fits with inquiry-based learning. So imagine that you have the numbers from 1 to 100 written on a board. Pick any two of them, erase them, and on the board, write the sum plus the product of those two numbers. So if you erase 2 and 5, the sum is 7, the product is 10, those two total to 17. So you write 17 on the board. Now 17 is up there twice, because it was already there in your initial list, and now you've put it up there again. But 2 and 5 are gone. 
that's okay. That's where we're at. Repeat this process of selecting any two numbers and replacing them with their sum and their product. So now you could select 17 and 17, because it's up there twice if you want it, or 99 and 27, and replace it with their sum and their product. What are the possible outcomes of this? And at this point, I want to give you three or four minutes to think about it again in that concept, in that construct, with those aspects of the problem, not what is the solution, and then we'll resume from there. So take about three minutes and think through those things. And I'll flip back and forth between the problem and those list of properties. Yes, only integers, only counting numbers. Yes, excellent. First thing you have to do, clarify the meaning. Judy, you're not being an active participant. You're not being an active participant. <laughs> we'll come back together in one minute. And if I could have your attention back up here, please. Uh oh, I'm being waved off by my fellow math teacher circle people. They want more time. We have spent three and a half plus hours on this problem in math teacher circles uh, before at several different sites that I've used this problem with and in very different directions. So it is possible to spend an extremely long time on this problem investigating various other side problems that come out, conjecturing, experimenting, exploring, creating, and communicating with each other about it. I'm sure some very rich discussions ensued rather than having you report out. I'm gonna touch on now another aspect of this that's really important, I think. So what are some key aspects of this problem that make it a really attractive problem to use in a professional development situation with teachers to give them an inquiry-based learning experience. One is the problem-solving techniques and skills that it brings out. One main one there could be ask a simpler question. And that is surprisingly a skill that a lot of middle school teachers just haven't really thought about. You know, they'll say, well, what about if it's not in step from 1 to 100? When they think of finally asking a simpler problem, they'll go, what about from 1 to 20? And then 1 to 10, no, you know, it's just not, in their nature yet, because probably of how they've been trained mathematically, to start it and go, well, what about just one, two, three? You know, then what about one, two, three, four? So kind of just working essentially backwards. You know, and you can also use a simpler oper operation. Instead of this is essentially x plus y plus xy, instead of that, what if it's just x plus y? Well, suddenly you're just adding the numbers from one to 100, and they can get an aha moment out of that. Um, so it has these aspects that it's a very rich mathematical problem. You can talk about generalizing it to other operations. Basically, a lot of different symmetric operations are going to work well for this as long as your variables are symmetric. Um, that's a key aspect of making good things happen here. Um, all of that's very important to the teachers to bring out the various aspects of inquiry-based learning and to help them develop their own problem-solving techniques. This leads all the way up to research level mathematics. I'm not going to go there in this talk, but it gets to the forefront. Some of you may have realized there's a numerative combinatorics going on. There's geometric interpretations of this where you're just missing a little square in a hypercube when you think through it. So all kinds of deep mathematics there, but very accessible as well. So you can enter this problem as somebody who simply knows how to add and multiply. So a third, fourth, fifth grader could start to tackle and explore this, all the way up to its of interest to research level mathematicians who have PhDs in mathematics, and there's interesting things there that they can explore. So very important there. It also connects very nicely to K-12 mathematics, which is a theme that's always extremely important to teachers. How does this help me now? Or, you know, and I'll, I'll address that more. But properties that come up, the commutative and the associative properties, 
The concepts of structure and symmetry arise naturally in this. Algebraic representation of the problem. All those key ideas jump out. <clears throat> It'd be wonderful to spend a lot more time talking about what math teacher circles are and giving a much more in-depth idea of what one is like and firsthand. And so we have built that into the program. It's not going to happen right now. It'll happen later this afternoon uh, from 4.10 to 5.25 during one of the breakout sessions. Paul Zeitz will lead a session, um, drawing a blank on the name of it, something about symmetry. Pardon? Mathematical games. And Tatiana and Alta will be assisting there. You can also look at the AIM website, just mathteachercircle.org for more info, and I'll put all of that up again later. What I want to transition to now, though, is what I'd call some other themes about inquiry-based learning and outcomes associated with it. At last year's conference, I felt like a main theme was that we want these transforming experiences to happen as an output or an outcome of inquiry-based learning with students. And the themes of empowerment and self-reliance came up a lot. Yesterday in Patrick's talk, he was making points about themes related to inquiry-based learning classes and how those skills translate over to research experience for undergrads. And I, um, buzzwords that popped up there, perseverance, communication, risk-taking, confidence, curiosity, and so forth. Well, what about K-12 teachers? Many of them don't have these skills and dispositions toward mathematics through no fault of their own. After all, we're the ones who trained them, higher ed at some point in the past. But if we want to afford change in the college students and in citizens in general in the country with regard to mathematics, we better think about the in-service teachers. If they can't actually do mathematics themselves, and by do mathematics I of course don't mean um, compute, do arithmetic, follow procedures, I mean do mathematics in the sense that we think of do mathematics in this room, then how can they facilitate in their that in their students? So one question I've heard people ask is, well, what if we don't worry about the in-service teachers, the ones who are already out there teaching, and we just instead focus on the ones who are in training? What if we try, try to get the new ones coming into the field? Well, there are a couple research and um, experience. There are a couple main limitations of that. One, it's just not enough. When they go out, just like a young person in pretty much any discipline or career field, they're going to absorb the culture of their school. So if their school isn't emphasizing mathematics as a rich, ongoing discipline, they're not going to either overall. And also, as came up yesterday, Beth mentioned this, they tend to teach how they were taught. And many of them, if they've been teaching for 20 years, have never had these rich experiences that we've discussed providing so much here in that room. They've had a very traditional background. And so those are two limitations of why it's not sufficient just to work on, well, let's hit the new people and not worry about the people out there already. So we need to hit those two levels at the same time. But there's some harsh realities right now for in-service teachers. They are judged so heavily based on standardized testing of students. We know there are a lot of limitations to that, and there are attempts going to do value-added modeling, et cetera, and improve that and base it on performance, but still extremely challenging, high stakes. They're expected to somehow improve year after year. Uh, some of the constraints on the schools are pretty impressive there, um, not in a positive way, per se. Administrators often don't understand math as more than a set of procedures. And I'm not attacking administrators there. That's society. That is most people in society, right? They, that's what they think of math as is computations and procedures to be memorized. Teachers haven't had pay raises or they've had very minimal pay raises while their class sizes have increased dramatically in the last few years. So a couple examples there. A high school teacher who's my co-director for the Rocky Mountain Math Teacher Circle we run, their class, she's gone from around 140 to over 180 students in the last couple years. And the middle school math teacher that co-developed the program with us now has 40 plus kids in a single class. In two of her single classes, she has 40 plus, and the others are in the upper 30s. So the class sizes have gone up drastically. 
it's a tough environment for them, but they still remain so committed to their, their students. They're in it because they love the students and they want to help them learn mathematics. So some impacts of this reality is we need to offer these teachers experiences that really do treat them as professionals, realize they're not 18-year-olds in training, that they're, they're in a different spot in their career, um, honor their knowledge of what they already do know, push them to grow mathematically, but also help them see clearly how what they're doing is going to help them and then help them help their students. So as much as we would love um, and as much fun as it is for many of us to say, go work through the basics of point set topology in an inquiry-based fashion, that's not the model that's going to pull them in. You might pull a few teachers in that way, but that's not how you're going to reach a larger group of teachers. So we need to think about how to do inquiry-based learning in a way that will pull them in. Um, and preliminary research is indicating that math teacher circles do do these things. Um, treat them like professionals, honor their knowledge, push them to grow, help them see how what they're doing does connect to their classroom, not meaning it helps them have a lesson for the next day, but how them developing mathematically in turn helps them develop their students mathematically, how that could transfer down there. So we would like to extend an invitation to people in this room especially to consider becoming more involved in math teacher circles or just in general in professional development for teachers in any form that honors our mathematical background that really emphasizes mathematics as a discipline. So some other themes that I pulled from Patrick's, uh, that is Patrick's talk yesterday, right? Make sure I have the right talks I was pulling from. That some key themes we want is membership in a professional disciplinary community. We want responsibility for their own learning, and we want an authentic engagement with disciplinary ideas. And if I could describe a typical math teacher circle session, it would be a really, really little mathematical research experience. And by really, really little, because you have an hour and a half to three and a half hours to a week, you don't have the six or eight weeks of an REU, you don't have the years of graduate training that many of us went through, you have smaller snippets of time, but you can do that in many smaller little pieces and help them get a feel for what really doing mathematics is about. I think the people in this room are very uniquely qualified to become involved in programs like this. And the reasons there are, first off, strong mathematical knowledge. A lot of times teachers graduate, you know, you graduate, say you have a bachelor's in math, your math knowledge is up here, your teaching knowledge and experience are down here. But then most professional development is centered around what's going on in the classroom and aspects of that. So you're not really using all of your full math major and your math knowledge, so that, not, that info tends to stay the same or even come down a little over time while your experience and knowledge about teaching and students goes up. And there's not a whole lot that focuses over here on making sure the mathematics still stays a central part. And so the people in this room have the ability and the knowledge to really help with that. This room's also full of practitioners of inquiry-based learning who understand that just having a PhD in math and going in and lecturing to the teachers isn't going to help them develop this mathematical skill set and understanding of mathematics as a discipline that we want. But the people, so we understand that, um, so that makes us uniquely qualified to get down there on the ground floor and try to contribute. Um, it's also full, just by virtue of seeing so many of the same faces year after year, this is a passionate and dedicated group of people, and there's a lot of different connections in here to organizations that can provide support. From the MAA, who supports the Math Teacher Circle program in various ways, to some of you may have access to um, local science and technology companies that could help you do something locally in your community with teachers that's problem solving, inquiry based oriented. A final thought that I want to say here is just to tie, and this is not the strongest argument, but I was putting the final piece together late last night and wanted to make this point. At the end of his talk yesterday, Jonathan Hodge said, 
that if inquiry, that inquiry based learning doesn't just make better students or mathematicians, it actually makes better people. And if we want to make the case, as I've tried to make, and the people this afternoon who run the sample session, I think will really emphasize this case even at a much deeper level, that math teacher circles are inquiry based learning for practicing teachers, then there's a lot of potential here for some transforming experiences to really transform those teachers and their perceptions of mathematics and have that then carry on to the K-12 setting. So if you're interested in this, there's my contact information. There's also Brianna Donaldson's contact information. She's the special projects director at the American Institute of Mathematics. She's really the one to contact about all of the logistics. How can you get involved at the mathteachercircle.org website? There's a map of all the circles across the country with links to all of them that have web pages. There's most likely one somewhere near you. There's one right here in Austin. There's ones just scattered all around the country. And then the final pitch I want to make is, again, there's a breakout session later today that Paul, Altha, and Tatiana are going to lead that will really give you a much more hands-on idea of what a math teacher circle is about um, that we would like to invite you to come participate in. And I will stop there. much. Um, because of our schedule, we don't have a lot of time built in for questions, but we do um, know that all of the speakers will be around. So we, James, if you are here and want to go ahead and start setting up your technology, I see no problem with y'all talking to Diana while we get James ready to start. So any questions while James is coming up getting started? How many teachers do you ordinarily have at one of these sessions of math circles? How many, pardon? How many teachers do you ordinarily have at one of these uh, math circles meetings? Um, it can vary drastically based on local situations. Um, some in more rural areas can get one started with 10 or 12 teachers per circle. We've had 25 plus on multiple occasions, and I think Judy might be the biggest that we've heard of when we've interviewed different circle leaders. Didn't you have 35 or 40 one time? Yes, not regularly, but we did have 35 or 40 at one event. But. Yes, primarily middle school level. There are some circles. It's only loosely organized by the American Institute of Mathematics. Local circles, local chapters have almost complete freedom to tailor it to meet their local situation. So most are indeed middle school level, but we certainly have some fifth grade teachers that often attend, and we certainly have some ninth and tenth grade, and a few upper secondary teachers that come um, and are very good about understanding not to just try to throw calculus and other tools that the um, middle school teachers might not be as comfortable with, um, but to really just explore and enjoy the problem from a lot of different angles. <clears throat> you mentioned that you concentrate more on the practices and the contents and the state core curriculum standards. Yes, more on the, definitely more on the practice of mathematics than on any specific content in the curriculum, yes. Teachers are, of course, totally panicked with the uh, tests that are going to roll around in 2014. Right. So, we are uh, by no means claiming that this is the be-all and end-all to what teachers need as far as professional development. We're simply making the case that it's an important niche that pr isn't super heavily addressed that in particular people here have the qualifications to contribute to. Well, we're going to start a couple in Chicago. And uh, the question is really uh, the group level, whether high school, middle grade, or elementary, and the second is uh, how do you organize around uh, practices or content? And uh, Because content, uh, as far as the course state core curriculum standards have been uh, promoted, uh, people are not paying any attention to the content. The uh, people are organizing around the uh, practices where there seems to be little attention to the content. So uh, can you organize a mass circles around content is the question. 
Sure, I certainly have content objectives embedded within, um, but it's just the main point isn't to ensure that they've mastered topic X when they come out of it. So in the sample problem I did today, I always make sure the associative commutative properties come out, the algebraic representations come out, um, we touch on some geometry related to it. So I can make sure that those things emerge that reinforce those ideas, but we're not working through some specific content standard. Um, we're going to have to pause there. I think that one's a little deeper than, than perhaps um, a one minute answer. Uh, but there is a lot of professional development that's content focused. Certainly the University of Arizona is heading up a tremendous amount related to the Common Core that's very heavily content oriented. Um, and the philosophy there is you can't separate the content and the practices.